Dear dignitaries, dear presidents, rectors, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear everybody who is in this audience, it's an enormous pleasure and honor for me to be here and to be able to give you this uh, final lecture of the fantastic uh, World Symposium on Copernicus. What a week it has been. It was already uh, said during the various speeches, we've seen, heard, seen and heard everything. We have heard astronomy, we've heard about history, we've heard, heard about philosophy, culture, religion, anthropology, so much was really happening centered around the theme of Copernicus. And what I hope to do today is sort of take that a little bit further also towards the future. The enormous revolution that uh, Copernicus basically uh, started uh, five centuries ago uh, in changing our view of the world, that's still continuing. And it's continuing thanks to the wonderful new telescopes that we have, of which James Webb's Space Telescope is just one example. But before we do that, let's uh, actually take a step backwards. Uh, astronomy. It was already said, astronomy is actually a very inclusive uh, topic. Uh, because viewing the night sky, as you can do here, uh, see here on this picture with the Warsaw Telescope, is actually available to everyone, everywhere on the world. And even in COVID times, <laughs> with social distancing, always we had the sky that we could look at and give us inspiration. And if you just look at the sky, then immediately you have to start to wonder, you know, where do we actually come from? What is our place in this gigantic universe? And of course, Copernicus uh, studied that <laughs> and was uh, fascinated by that. But just as much the young children here in Turun, in Poland, elsewhere in the world, are fascinated by looking at the night sky and they get actually inspiration from there. Now I'm actually standing here also as past president of the International Astronomical Union, that is the worldwide organization of all professional astronomers, some 12,000 astronomers worldwide of more than 100 countries. And Poland has been one of the earliest members uh, in 1922, it joined already just three years after the foundation of the International Astronomical Union. And Poland and the IAU and Copernicus have actually gone hand in hand over this past century. Uh, once every three years we have our General Assembly and you see that there was an extraordinary General Assembly in 1973, uh, especially to commemorate 500 years of Copernicus. There are symposia in uh, Poland under the IAU premises. Uh, here you see one dedicated uh, to planetary systems like uh, our own solar system with Copernicus. Um, but just last week there was another IAU symposium on planetary nebula actually happening in uh, Krakow. The executive committee of the uh, IAU has six vice presidents, but it was not until 73 until we had our first female vice president, and that was actually Wilhelmina Ivanovska, uh, who was actually a professor here at the university in Turun. And another connection between the IAU and uh, Poland is, is certainly the outreach and the education, which are so central of also the Polish Astronomical Society and of magazines like Urania and Science Now Studios that produce wonderful exhibitions and that uh, are an inspiration to many people. Another function of the IAU is actually the naming of objects. And um, I actually looked it up. This is where Copernicus, uh, the asteroid 1322, is today. It's just touching the, the orbit of Mars, uh, actually. You see that Co uh, Copernicus is actually a bit eccentric uh, asteroid. <laughs> it's uh, having a very unusual orbit. Uh, but this is actually the asteroid uh, that was named by the, the IEU after Copernicus. There's also a lunar crater named after Copernicus. And uh, then there is uh, actually a whole story. Uh, that's uh, the system uh, 55 uh, Cancri A that is named after Copernicus. So Poland and worldwide astronomy uh, go actually hand in hand, not just to the IAU, but also to the European Astronomical Society. Uh, in 2023, it had its uh, major uh, meeting actually in uh, Krakow. Um, you've heard already during the opening that uh, Poland is member of these big international organizations for 
putting the biggest telescopes on the ground and in space, the European Southern Observatory and uh, ESA. And there are some fantastic uh, Polish astronomers. I had the pleasure myself to, to know Bodan Paczynski when he was in Princeton at the time, the father of Ogle, the talk that you heard from uh, Udalski uh, on the opening day. And of course, uh, the wonderful work by uh, Wolchan on the detection of the first exoplanet around the uh, pulsar. So, um, Copernicus changed our world views then, some 500 years ago, and this particular diagram has been uh, debated a lot also in the historical section uh, that I had the pleasure to attend over the last uh, uh, few days. Um, but one of my um, um, hobbies is actually uh, astronomy and art. And this is one of two uh, paintings that we actually print, that we have uh, at home, um, about two centuries old. And it shows the Copernican system in relation to the Ptolemaic and the uh, Tychoniac um, uh, views of the world. A wonderful uh, uh, painting, uh, print. But even more relevant is this particular print um, that's hanging right next to it in our house. And this is called the Universal Solar System. And remember, this is made two centuries ago, well before the first planet outside our solar system was detected. But here, this uh, um, artist was already speculating that you have here in the center our own solar system, as it was known at that time, with some uh, seven planets uh, then. But he was already speculating that other planetary systems don't need to look at all like our own planetary system. Some have more planets, some have less, some closer in, some further out. And uh, that's, of course, exactly the revolution in astronomy, one of the revolutions in astronomy that is happening at this very moment. So let's look at these changes, how our view of the universe has actually changed dramatically over the last 100 years. 100 years ago, we only knew of the atoms and the molecules. We didn't know uh, that about this dark matter and dark energy that actually make up the bulk of the universe. 100 years ago, we only knew of our own Milky Way uh, as a galaxy. And now we know that the universe is actually teeming with galaxies and we can see the galaxies down uh, to the very earliest times, just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. This is exactly the era that the James Webb Space Telescope is now probing. Um, here we are some 13.8 million billion years after the Big Bang. We now know that there are supermassive black holes, not just the stellar black holes, but even supermassive black holes, and also in the center of our Milky Way. And 100 years ago, we had no clue where the elements in our body came from, the oxygen, the carbon, the hyd nitrogen that we are made of. Um, we now know that they are made actually by nuclear fusion in stars, um, and that they are then expelled in supernova and nova explosions back into the interstellar medium. And of course, 100 years ago, we knew only of eight planets <laughs> and that we we're all in our own solar system. And now we know that actually planets are more common than stars uh, in our galaxy. Uh, we now know, thanks to uh, the discovery of exoplanets, that they are actually very common and that every star has, on average, at least one planet. But often of a type that we don't have in our own solar system. That's a new view. These uh, planets can be uh, <coughs> uh, somewhat more uh, like Jupiter, they can be like Saturn, but the bulk of them are actually somewhere in between Earth and Neptune, ten times the mass of the Earth, a type of planet that we don't have in our own solar system. So this raises immediately the question as to what the composition is, how habitable they are, uh, and, uh, and, and, and really whether there could be life elsewhere in uh, the universe. And sort of directly related to that is also the question, how were we formed, actually, some 4.6 billion years ago, our solar system? Uh, how was it actually formed? And we are getting new clues on that uh, from uh, going to asteroids and picking up small pieces of material there and bringing them back to Earth to study in laboratories. Or going to a comet. A comet is not just rock, but rock plus ice. Um, and actually the uh, Rosetta mission uh, landed for the first time in humankind on a uh, comet uh, in 2014. And these are all clues from the leftovers from uh, our own solar system, clues as to what happened in our own early solar system. 
Now, astronomy and all of these new views that we are getting uh, are actually driven by major facilities, major facilities in space and on the ground. We want to look every time, we want to look sharper, we want to look more sensitive. Um, we, that can only happen if we improve our technology and we improve the size of our telescopes. And here are some examples of very famous telescopes like the Hubble, like the European Southern Observatory, and like this uh, telescope with the Atacama Large Mean Meteor Array, ALMA, uh, that is actually the first worldwide uh, collaboration in astronomy. All of these are multinational, intercontinental collaborations. That's the characteristic. And what is wonderful is that all of them also have uh, open data, open archives that are accessible to anywhere, anybody in the world. So you can also go to the archives of these uh, telescopes and download data, uh, download data and look at them uh, yourselves. So one of these big new facilities, and certainly the biggest at the moment, uh, biggest step that is happening now, is the James Webb Space Telescope that undoubtedly many of you have heard about in the, in the news. It's the new flagship mission from uh, NASA in collaboration with the European Space Agency, ESA, and uh, Canada. The name James Webb um, is not a scientist, very unusual. <laughs> Usually a big telescope is named after a famous scientist, like Copernicus. Um, but uh, in this case, it's actually named after the NASA administrator that was uh, uh, responsible for the, the, the moon program in the 1960s. So this has been a 30-year journey to get there. Um, what you see here is the launch uh, in, the, in the corner, the final stage when uh, Webb was uh, released from the Ariane rocket, and it was a very emotional moment because it took 30 years to get to this point. Um, and it has really a testimony to the thousands of engineers, technicians, managers, and also scientists that made this happen. It's also a, um, a mission that is uh, of the kind, a price tag, that only the United States can do in collaboration with uh, partners. And so it's really uh, the type of mission that you can do only once per generation. So where is Webb now? Well, Webb is actually uh, four times the distance of the uh, Earth to the moon. So it went well beyond uh, the moon. It's in the so-called L2, Lagrangian point two, uh, a point where it's actually very stable um, and where the sun, the Earth, and the moon, which are sort of uh, the noise, um, provide the noise on the background, uh, are always on the same side. And you see it travels actually with Earth uh, around, uh, around the sun. Now, what makes Webb actually unique? Well, Webb is big. It's six and a half meters in diameter. That's for a space telescope that is very big. And here you see a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, one-to-one model uh, there. Another thing that makes it unique is its eyes. Its eyes uh, are not like our eyes. That's what you see here <laughs> with our own eyes um, in the visible radiation. You're all familiar with uh, X-rays. You're all familiar with radio. Um, but actually where Webb looks is in between in the infrared, um, which is very much obscured um, the radiation from space by our own atmosphere, which is of course full of water and CO2 um, that blocks the radiation from space. So that's why we have to go to, to space. Now on Webb there are actually four instruments, um, a combination of cameras, like you have in your iPhone, um, and also spectrometers that can basically unravel the, the colors um, and into the colors of the rainbow. And these are very uh, sophisticated spectrographs. They are not just pointing at one position, but they are actually pointing at multiple uh, uh, positions at the same time. And so everything combined, the size, the detectors, the, inst uh, the, the, the instruments, make that the sensitivities are about a, a factor of 100 to 1,000 better than earlier instruments. And that means that we surely are going to find surprises if we have that much of discovery space. My own involvement with Webb has been for more than 25 years. I've actually been part of the European consortium that uh, co-built the mid-infrared instrument on, uh, on James Webb. Now, why actually are we going to the infrared? 
Um, well, that is uh, because uh, if they have uh, um, radiation at very large distances, actually by the time it gets to us, thanks to the Doppler uh, shift, it's actually shifted to the red, and it shifts completely out of the visible range into the infrared. So it's shifted to the red, and uh, that is, uh, means that we can also actually use that sort of as a time machine uh, far away, basically also means long ago. Why the infrared? Um, that was one reason. The other reason is that we can actually peer very deep actually into these dust clouds and see the burst places of galaxies, stars and planets. And that's exactly what the web science is. It's basically going from first lights to new planets. Now, the first image that was released uh, on uh, July 11 uh, last year uh, was of this uh, deepest image of the universe uh, to date. Let me take you through this. This is actually a star, this six uh, um, star uh, image is a diffraction pattern of the telescopes that recognize you immediately that this must be a web uh, image. Uh, this is a cluster of galaxies that actually amplifies the radiation that comes from behind, so it provides a little bit of a lens effect. It also distorts the images of the distant galaxies a little bit, like you see here in this fil filament. And so thanks to this sort of lens effect, it means we can look even deeper. And indeed, even this first image, which was not yet that deep, um, showed already and revealed already galaxies that are more than 13 billion years old, so just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And that's indeed a very active uh, topic of discussion as to can we find these very earliest uh, galaxies, very earliest stars. Another recent uh, discovery is uh, uh, the supermassive black holes, which we can see now out to very large uh, distances. Here is one that is uh, existed already just 570 million years after the Big Bang. This is a very recent result from last month. Um, its mass is only that about a million solar masses, about comparable with the mass of the supermassive black hole in the center of our own galaxy. So this again raises one of these questions is how did those supermassive black holes come to be? Star forming galaxies as well, beautiful star forming galaxies that we see over here in the, the phantom uh, galaxies. What is red is, is basically where star formation is currently occurring. This is where a whole new clusters of stars are being born. And the same you see here, interacting galaxies here in the Cartwheel galaxy, where a burst of star formation is actually taking place at the moment. In the last part of my talk, I would like to focus now on really the other worlds close by. We've seen that Webb already gives us new views of our universe. Now let's look at new views of other worlds. And for that, let's actually go back to the starry night. You all recognize this uh, constellation, I hope. Yes, that's Orion. And, uh, <laughs> but few people actually ask the question, what is in between those stars when you look at Orion? Well, our origins actually start in the very, very dilute gas that is actually present between the stars. And here you see the Orion Nebula uh, beautifully. That's where, at the moment, new stars and planets are being born. And you see that also go here very nicely in this, by now, very famous image of uh, Webb, um, where you see a part of one of these clouds illuminated by uh, young stars. And here inside these clouds, everything that is a red dot is actually where new stars are forming. Here you see actually a, uh, um, a jet coming out of a young star that is trying to push away its surroundings. And here's another one with a nice bow shock uh, that is plunging into the cloud. So these are all young stars um, in the very earliest stages. The pillars of creation, now in the light of uh, JWST, the Mi our MIRI instrument. A little bit of a spooky uh, image it looks. It came out actually around Halloween. Um, but uh, you see here, again, these, these dots here that are young stars that are being born at this very moment at the tip or here of these uh, filaments. And this is a picture that was released just yesterday. It's from our own uh, JWST program. Uh, again, of a protostar um, that has a jet that is plunging into the surroundings and is, is expelling all of this uh, material. The protostar in the disk we cannot see, uh, that's actually hidden behind 
the uh, dust. All right, good. So we've gone from very large scales to smaller and smaller scales. And now we go to the smallest scales. Now we go to the scales of our own solar system, the scales of protoplanetary disks that actually form when a star collapses to form a, a star. Uh, this, these rotating disks of uh, um, gas and dust and in which planets can form, and which is of course entirely analogy with our own uh, formation of our own solar nebula uh, as postulated, for example, by, by Kant. And you see here a young planet actually carving a gap into that uh, disk. It's difficult to see the young planets themselves, but what we can see is definitely these, these gaps that are carved in these disks. And these disks can now be imaged. This is all my images. You see here a whole gallery of these planet-forming disks. Uh, you see the structure in there. We think that this is actually planet formation in action happening now. And one of the big questions is in then, of course, what is then the material out of which these new planets are made? And this is where Webb comes in again. The synergy that we now have between some of these very biggest world-class telescopes. On the one hand, ALMA that is studying the outer parts of the disks, and on the other hand, the Webb telescope that is actually sensitive to the, the warm gas in the inner part of disks where terrestrial planets are forming. And this is again a brand new result uh, released on July 24, um, where we now use actually JWST in one of these planet forming disks uh, to, to look for whether or not there is water here where terrestrial planets are forming. And yes, we did see actually very clearly here the fingerprint of warm water in that inner part of that uh, disk. But we, sometimes we don't see water, and that's also a surprise. This is another disk where we don't see water, but where we see the fingerprints happening of other molecules, of acetylene, very carbon-rich acetylene, of uh, benzene, <laughs> uh, quite complex carbonations molecules. Um, so that's another puzzle. Why are some disks uh, very water-rich, others are very carbon-rich. What kind of planets do we make out of those? Well, that's the big question. How do we build planets and what sets their composition? Why are we, why is our Earth like it is, with some water and some carbon uh, happening there? So by studying these disks, we learn about the, 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 the history, actually, of uh, also more mature planets. And speaking about mature planets, this is also where Webb is actually shining at the moment. This is uh, one of the earliest detections of water in an exoplanet atmosphere. This is a, uh, a giant planet. Uh, here we see, for the first time, a very clear signature of carbon dioxide in those planets. Carbon dioxide, CO2, is very abundant. We see it almost everywhere. And then this is, a, a, again, a press release just earlier this week, a few days ago, this was released, the first detection of methane, actually, in a exosolar planet, and especially uh, of a very um, um, sort of not-so-massive planet, a Neptune-mass planet, uh, likely having an ocean and an H2 um, uh, atmosphere. And again, carbon dioxide present as well. So, these kinds of uh, excitements are happening daily, as you can see. <laughs> it has been a very exciting week with all kinds of new discoveries uh, from Web actually announced. So, it's good that my talk is actually at the end of the week and not in the beginning of the week. Good. Future new views. Where do we go from here? Um, Copernicus did his observations from Fromberg and from, from Olsting. We are building now sort of our new cathedrals. Um, the extremely large telescopes of the ESO here, here in an animation uh, scene, uh, but this is the actual construction. Again, a few days ago, you see it actually being put together and progress is clearly being made on its construction. And this telescope will be another fantastic instrument to study this question, are we alone in the universe? So let me end by saying that I hope to have shown you that astronomy and science um, very exciting, um, very exciting results happening on a daily basis. They provide inspiration, inspiration to astronomers, but also inspiration for others. But even more importantly, they provide us with a perspective of our place in the universe. A little bit of sense also of vulnerability. We are only that tiny little dot in that gigantic 
universe. It brings us a little bit of modesty in that way, and also tolerance. And I think especially in these challenging times, in these trying times that we have as humankind, it's important to realize that we are all world citizens under the same beautiful sky. Thank you very much.